Today is the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, also known as the Feast of Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ in Latin. It is celebrated every year on the Thursday or Sunday after Trinity Sunday. This solemnity reminds us of Jesus' presence in the Eucharist, body and blood, soul and divinity. Whenever we receive communion, we establish a deep union with Jesus in the Eucharist, which enhances our fellowship with God. It deepens our lives of holiness and it builds our attitudes of prayer and service towards our brothers and sisters. After the Mass, the Blessed Sacrament is carried in a monstrance in procession. This is accompanied by prayers and singing to honor Jesus in the Eucharist. However, due to the rainy season, especially in temperate regions, the procession is moved to the last Sunday of the year on the Solemnity of Christ the King. The readings today lead us to reflect on the Eucharist, the sacrament of love, as a source of nourishment for our bodies and soul and enrichment of our communities. The first reading from Genesis chapter 14 from verse 18 to 20 is the story of King Melchizedek of Salem blessing Abram. Abram had gone to rescue his nephew Lot from those who took him captive and he defeated them. Upon his return, Melchizedek, king of Salem, offered him bread and wine. Salem, meaning peace, could allude to a historical city or is a short form of Jerusalem. So Melchizedek, the first priest named in the Bible, a priest of El Elyon, that is God the Most High, blessed Abraham, fulfilling God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Melchizedek derives his name from the Hebrew words Melech, which means king, and Tzedek, which means righteousness. And so this king of righteousness is the king of Salem, meaning king of peace. He presents a significant token of goodwill to Abram. While bread and water would have been the staple meal at the time, bread and wine were more of a royal affair. See 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 20. And it was often accompanied by animal sacrifices. See Numbers chapter 15, verse 2 to 10. So he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who had delivered your enemies into your hand. In this story, we see the significance of Melchizedek, as well as the typological allusion to Christ in the New Testament. Psalm 110 verse 4, also quoted in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6, references Christ as a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, as Melchizedek is, one, the king of righteousness, Jesus is our righteousness. See 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. As he is the king of peace, Jesus is the prince of peace. See Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Three, as he had no beginning nor end, Jesus is Alpha and Omega. See Revelation chapter 22, from verse 12 to 13. As he is blessed, as he blessed Abraham as a priest, so does God bless us through Jesus, our great high priest. See Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 to 26. And as he offered bread and wine in thanksgiving for Abraham, so does Jesus offer us his body and blood under the appearance of bread and wine in the Eucharist. See Matthew chapter 26, from verse 26 to 30. Hence, as the Old Testament looks towards Jesus, the saving King, so do we look back to his sacrifice on the cross for our salvation. And as Abraham partook of the bread and wine in anticipation of Jesus, the priest, so do we partake of the communion that gives us life. We pray that our appreciation of Jesus in the Eucharist would bring us life, health, and salvation. 
We also pray for God's strength and deliverance for Fathers Stephen Ojapa, MSP, and Oliver Okwara, and their companions who are still held captive by kidnappers for the past 21 days. May God protect them and, like Lot, release them from captivity. The second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. These verses report one of the most important and oldest written summaries on the Lord's Supper. These verses come within the context of Paul's rebuke of the Corinthian Christian community who had turned the ecclesia, that is, the coming together of believers, into a clown show where the rich and unsocially affluential display their wealth to the detriment of the weak and poor. Although they gathered for the Lord's Supper, each one goes ahead with his own meal, and one is hungry and another is drunk. 1 Corinthians 11.21 To correct this unfortunate behavior, St. Paul reminded them that the celebration of the Lord's Supper is not of human origin, but from the Lord himself. The expression, Kyriakon Depnon, indicates that Depnon, Supper, belongs to the Lord. As St. Paul says, what I have received from the Lord is what I also handed on to you. Thus, anyone who participates in it is only sharing in what belongs to the Lord. So if the Corinthian Christians were actually assembled for the Lord's Supper, they would have gathered everything they brought from their houses into one place instead of each person eating his own food. The poor with their meager portions and the rich with their sumptuous delicacies. Such form of feasting, according to Paul, does not bring honor to the Lord. In our passage, there are important points we ought to highlight concerning the Lord's Supper. The first thing St. Paul reminded the Corinthians is that the Lord's Supper is a tradition that has, been, that has to be sustained. What I received from the Lord, I handed on to you. To receive, parelabon, and then pass on, paradoka, establishes a tradition, paradosis. The reality that is passed on from one person to another, from one generation to another, does not change. And every generation that receives the reality becomes participants in it. That is to say, the Lord's Supper as a reality in the church is not diminished in efficacy since the time Jesus instituted it. However, when abuses occur, the tradition is distorted. That a tradition is distorted does not mean the reality is distorted. Anytime the distortion is corrected, the reality that is sustained within the tradition continues its already established effect. Second, the Lord's Supper is a thanksgiving. When, we ha when he had given thanks, Kai Eucharistesas, this is where the common name Holy Eucharist is derived from. The participation in the Lord's Supper is an expression of gratitude to God. Third, to eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord's Supper is to eat his body and drink his blood. Despite the grammatical difficulty of presuming that the masculine noun artos, bread, is substituted by a neuter noun tuto, the emphatic tuto, this, with reference to the bread and cup in the hands of Jesus, and the function of to so mamu, my body, and he kainedia theke en to emo hamati, the new covenant in my blood, indicates that Jesus is not speaking of the bread and cup as representational symbols of his body and blood. Rather, the bread is his body and the cup his blood. What we have is a real presence because of the substantial changes that have taken place. The church expresses this as transubstantiation. That is, the accidents our senses grasp are those of bread and wine but substantially we are taking the body and blood of Jesus. Fourth, the bread and drink that Jesus changed into his body and blood were given to him. As we read, on the night he was betrayed, he received bread, elaben arton. The point I want to stress here is the fact that we always bring in gifts which are then offered by the priest, Altel Christus, in thanksgiving to God, so that they become the body and blood of our Lord. Fifth, the celebration of the Lord's Supper must be kept as a memorial, anamnesi. The phrase, tuto poiete, do this, 
can function either as an indicative present tense or an imperative present tense. While the indicative affirms the actuality of the phrase, the imperative establishes that the memorial is a command to be obeyed. Finally, the passage draws our attention to the idea that the Lord's Supper constitutes a body of believers who believe or who receive the meal as his followers and who receive the cup as an indication of conscious participation in the benefits of the new covenant. On this solemnity of Corpus Christi, our gospel is from the feeding of the 5,000. In the preceding pericope, Jesus had sent out his apostles on a mission. On their return, Jesus took them to a place in Bethsaida, where they could be alone as if to say, after the long period of work, you need rest and time to refuel. But when the crowds learned that they had gone to Bethsaida, they followed them. Being tired, Jesus could have dismissed the crowds to give the apostles a chance to rest. But he welcomed them, spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and cured the sick among them. Jesus sacrificed their rest for love of the people. Getting late, the twelve wanted Jesus to send the crowds away to go into the surrounding villages to find food and lodging because they were in a deserted place, Eremos in Greek. But Jesus asked them to give the people something to eat themselves. They had only five loaves and two fish, and there were about 5,000 men. Jesus made them sit in groups of 50, looked up to heaven, blessed the loaves, and gave the disciples to distribute to the crowd. The people ate, were satisfied, and had 12 baskets full of scraps. It was a miracle of multiplication. Some scholars say the people had their own food and everyone had enough as they began to share among themselves. The evidence that it was a miracle is that 12 baskets were left over. This miracle recapitulates the feeding of the Israelites in the wilderness and anticipates the Last Supper. The word Eremos invites us to think about the Israelites in the wilderness or desert. God fed the Israelites with the miraculous manna from heaven in the desert for 40 years. Jesus is therefore depicted here as the new Moses who feeds the new Israelites. Another element is Jesus making the people sit in groups of 50 and the apostles distributing the food. The 12 apostles represent the new Israel. As Moses divided the twelve tribes of Israel into groups of thousands, hundreds, fifty, and tens, and appointed leaders over them, Jesus gave the apostles a foretaste of how they would be leaders of even smaller groups, guided by other disciples. But the feeding of the five thousand also points to the Last Supper. Luke uses some verbs which we find at the Last Supper. Jesus takes the loaves. He blesses, he breaks, and he gives. The exact Greek words, lambano, to take, klao, to break, and didomi, to give, are used in both instances. Read Luke chapter 22, verse 19. A different word, eulageo, to praise, is substituted for eucharisteo, to give thanks, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. That means that Jesus was already revealing to his apostles how he would multiply his body and blood under the appearances of bread and wine. At the Last Supper, Jesus gave his body and blood to nourish his followers, and we too have become beneficiaries as we celebrate the Eucharist every time. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.